We're going to be in John chapter 9, and uh, it's, the whole chapter is 41 verses, and I'm going to read most of it, and by the end of the study we will have read all of it, because there's no way to see this story without reading the whole chapter. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to read the first 34 verses, uh, but you have to see all of this to get the understanding of what's happening here. So this is John chapter 9, and I'll start at verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world." When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. And he said, the guy said, no, I'm he. And therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And he answered and he said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. And then they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath, referring to Jesus. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him, because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received a sight, until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. <laughs> what lovely parents. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, in other words, if they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. And so they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. And then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> and then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were, were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. In other words, they excommunicated him. Now, this is not the only story in the Bible where Jesus heals someone who was blind. But this is the only story in the Bible where it is recorded that someone received their sight who was blind from birth. Who was blind from birth. This guy had never seen in his entire life. I want you to imagine this. Because when he has this wonderful encounter with Jesus, he's going to see the faces of his loved ones for the very first time. He's about to see the beauty of an orange sunset and 
blue skies and green grass and winter snow for the very first time. The buildings that you have only touched, the flowers that you have only smelled, the food that you have only tasted, that rooster that you've only heard at 5 a.m. every morning, you are now about to see for the very first time when Jesus touches your eyes and the optic nerves are regenerated and it bombards your brain with images and sights and colors all for the very first time, something that most of us probably take for granted every day. But this story is much more than a story about physical blindness and the recovery of sight. This story is about opening the eyes of the heart, that those who are blind to the things of God may see And those who claim that they know and see God but really don't would understand just how blind they really are. This is why Jesus would say later in this story, if you glance ahead to verse 39, this is exactly why Jesus would say in verse 39, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. I've entitled today's teaching, Sight for the Blind. And I don't know what happened to my slides, but there was a beautiful slide that, (laughs) there it is. A little trick there. I couldn't see it, and now I see it. (laughs) Sight for the blind. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time in your word. Use this story now to speak to our hearts. We thank you for your timeless truth, and we ask you, Lord, to minister from this story, especially to those today who are gonna receive their sight for the first time, because you're gonna open the eyes of their heart and they're gonna see you, Lord. And so we thank you in advance and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, the scene of this story is Jerusalem. We're, We're still in Jerusalem as we've made our way through the Gospel of John. From chapter seven, it tells us that Jesus is in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. It was his custom when he would go to Jerusalem for one of these major feasts that he would teach in the Temple Mount area during the day. And then he, along with his disciples, would retreat to the Mount of Olives where they would sleep at night. Then they'd come back to the Temple Mount during the day and again repeat that. He would teach and then they would uh, go to the Mount of Olives uh, for the night. So in chapter 8, this is the, the same continuous story where Jesus is on the Temple Mount area and the first part of chapter 8, he encounters this woman caught in adultery and that was our lesson two weeks ago on the topic of grace. Still in chapter 8, last week we looked at the story when the Jewish uh, leaders questioned Jesus' authority and divinity and so uh, the lesson last week was on truth. And now it's, again, the same continuation. He's there for the Feast of Tabernacles. He teaches during the day. He goes to sleep on the Mount of Olives. This is another occasion when he's still there in Jerusalem. He's in the Temple Mount area, and he and his disciples pass by this man that chapter 1, verse 1 tells us was blind from birth. And his disciples ask Jesus a question that is typical for that particular time. And the question they asked Jesus was, when they look at this blind man, they ask Jesus, who sinned, Rabbi, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now let me tell you why that was a typical question in those days, because the Jews believed in something that was uh, later known as the law of retribution. The law of retribution basically says that if you're suffering, it must be because there's sin in your life. If there's something that is tragic in your life, some difficulty, some trial, some physical illness, some loss, uh, some, some form of suffering, it must be that there's either sin in your life and God is punishing you for your sin or your parents have sinned and you're suffering God's punishment because of your parents' sin. The law of retribution, that's how it went. And it wasn't just in Jesus' day, it was centuries before that. You remember the book of Job? In the book of Job, Job's bonehead friends thought the same thing. When Job was suffering, he, was, he, he had lost everything. He had lost his children, he had lost his uh, 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 livelihood, he had lost his health. 
and he's suffering and he, and, he, and he doesn't understand why all this is happening. And his friends say to Job, well, basically you're suffering because there must be some sin in your life. That's the reason why all this hardship is happening because there's sin in your life. One of his friends, Eliphaz the Temanite in Job 4 verse 8 said this, as I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. And so, Job, there must be sin in your life. The problem is, in Job 1.1, the introductory verse of the whole book tells us that Job was upright, and he was a righteous man, and he was blameless in God's eyes, and he feared God. So, we know about Job's life that he was a blameless man in the eyes of God, not that he was sinless. But in other words, the statement from the very beginning of the book of Job is that Job's hardships were not because he had sinned against God. We know because of the perspective of having the 30,000 foot view, the book of Job tells us that God allowed Satan, Satan for a season, to torment Job so that at the end of the story we could see God's faithfulness to us through Job in the difficulties that we encounter that aren't always associated with our sin against God. So when you look at Job's story, for sure, it's clear that though he was suffering, and and underwent much hardship in his life, it was not directly tied to any kind of sin in his life against God. That said, the Bible does warn us. Paul writes in Galatians 6 verse 7 that we should not be deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And in Proverbs 13, 15, it says the way of the transgressor is hard. So it is true that when we make sinful choices, we will sometimes have to suffer hardship for those sinful choices. That said, not every hardship in our life is because of sinning against God. Sometimes we will encounter suffering, trials, hardship, difficulty, disease, because those are the byproducts of a sinful world. And because all of us live in a sinful world, we will sometimes suffer the byproducts associated with a sinful world. So it it is fair to say in general terms that all forms of suffering are related to sin, but it is not fair to say that all forms of suffering in our lives is directly related to our sin against God. Sometimes it's just because we live in a sinful fallen world and we have to put up with some of the agony and trials and suffering associated with living in a sinful world. So Jesus' disciples believed this law of retribution, that The reason this guy is blind is because either he sinned or his parents sinned. So, Jesus, which one has sinned? And Jesus has to correct their theology. So, in verse 3, Jesus says to them, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, that's New King James, from which I commonly read, but here's from the NIV. Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in his life. And so, in that answer, Jesus teaches us two things. Number one, he debunks the myth that every misfortune is God's punishment for your sin or your your parents' sin. And that needs to just sink into some of you because... For some of you, some tragic things have happened and you are convinced it's because God is punishing you. And, and if it's not for your sin, it's something your parents did and you think now I'm suffering for their sin. And Jesus comes along and he says, now let me just tell you something. This guy's suffering, his blindness, not every condition is related to personal sin or your parents' sin. So that's the first thing he wants us to understand. The other thing he wants us to understand here is that he teaches us in that answer. He said, said, but this happened that the work of God might be displayed in the guy's life. So we need to understand that even related to the suffering or the trials or the misfortunes that we go through that are not directly related to our sin against God or our parents' sin against God, nevertheless, they might often be an opportunity for the display of God in our lives. So that physical illness, that marital difficulty, that prodigal child, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, all these things are opportunities for God's faithfulness and power to go on display. 
And so we can either look at every tragedy and hardship we face as, well, this must be punishment from God, okay? Once you've eliminated that because you realize I've not sinned against God in a direct way that thus has resulted in this consequence, then what we need to do is realize, okay, but nevertheless, I'm going through this, and this is an opportunity for the power and faithfulness of God to go on display in my life. And then Jesus does something here in this story that is very unusual. After he corrects his disciples' bad theology, then it tells us that he spits in the dirt, and he makes little mud patties, and he applies it to the eyes of this guy who is blind. And then he tells the guy, now go wash off the mud, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the word in Hebrew, Siloam, means scent. And so the guy goes to the pool of Siloam. Now, when we go to Israel, uh, this is one of the places that we will stop and we'll have this Bible study again at the pool of Siloam. They only discovered the pool of Siloam in 2005. It had been unknown until then, but it's part of the old city, the lower part of the old city. And they haven't unearthed all the pool of Siloam, and they probably never will because it goes under an Arab village and they're not going to disturb that. But we know where today the pool of Siloam is. It's about a quarter of a mile walk from the Temple Mount area where this story happened to the Pool of Siloam. So this guy's got mud patties and he's like having to walk a quarter of a mile and people no doubt are looking at him like, what in the world happened to you? What kind of a facial is this? What spa did you go to? And so he makes his way. And uh, a lot of people have wondered, why did Jesus perform this miracle this particular way? Using the spit and mud to accomplish this miracle? Well, some Bible scholars say because he was trying to connect people's understanding that he's God because God fashioned Adam from the dust of the earth and thus displayed his creative miraculous power. And Jesus perhaps is using a similar thing with mud to try to show people, you, you know, the only one who can do miraculous things with dirt, that would be God. Oh, that would be me. So some Bible scholars say he was kind of asserting his divinity. But others believe, you know, I just kind of wonder if, if Jesus is doing it this way because God uses different methods to accomplish his purposes. He's, he's not restricted to one way of healing people. When you, when you look in the Bible, there are times that Jesus spoke the word and somebody was healed. There are times that he laid hands on people and they were healed. And then you see here, he uses spit and mud to accomplish healing in this guy's life. I mean, God is God and he can choose to do whatever he wants to accomplish his purposes. He could have sneezed in this guy's face and said, be healed. He could have done whatever he wanted to do. This guy was healed because Jesus just determined to do it that way. Now, remember, when you read this story, okay, you, you got to try to put yourself there and think about this. Remember, the guy was blind, but he was not deaf. So guess what he's hearing? <laughs> he's hearing that. Let me tell you a conversation they did not have, okay? Guarantee you they did not have this conversation. Blind guy. Jesus? Yes? Are you spitting right now? <laughs> yep. Blind guy. Um, what do you intend to do with that spit, Jesus? Jesus, don't worry about it. Blind guy. Because if you are going to use that to try to heal me, I'm kind of not into spit. I don't even drink out of other people's cups, okay? So perhaps there's another method you could accomplish your purposes. Guarantee you that didn't happen. Here's why. Because when you're desperate enough for God, you don't care what method he uses. You just want his miracle. That's the truth. The reason why some of you have not received from God is because you're not desperate enough. And you have determined how and when God should do something. And God is not obligated to work within our parameters. God is God, and He will do for us according to His timing on His terms. Right. And when we get to the place where we finally say, Lord, have your way, do with me as you wish, that's when we will receive. Right. This guy was just open to, okay, Lord, just do whatever you're going to do. That's right. And then... The Lord did an amazing and wonderful work. And so we seek Him while we wait for Him. 
In verses 6 and 7 in our story here, it says, And Jesus anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, verse 7, And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. <laughs> and I wish I could say it, everybody lived happily ever after. God bless you, have a wonderful day. That's the end of the Bible study. But unfortunately, not everybody was happy for this guy. Very few people were happy for this guy. His neighbors didn't even recognize him. His parents basically disowned him. And the religious leaders shamed him and excommunicated him. All why? Because he got a miracle one day from Jesus. So we're going to look here at these three particular groups because these three particular groups you're going to run into from time to time too. The first group, the neighbors. If you look at verses 8 and 9 again, look at verse 8. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? And some said, yeah, this is he. And others said, no, he's like him. And the guy said, no, I, I am he. Now, this is curious to me. The neighbors here were having a debate as to whether or not this really was the blind guy who had been sitting and begging on the street for years. And so some say, yeah, this is the guy. And others are like, no, 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 only looks like him. It's not really him. And the guy standing there is going, no, 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 it really is me. Now, I wonder why they had this debate. And I think for two reasons. Number one, because this guy was completely out of context. You know, for years, he was the blind guy. He was sitting, begging. That's the way that blind people would survive in the day. You would sit with a cup and you beg for people to drop money in as they walked by. That was the only way that he could earn a living. And so they're used to seeing him as the guy sitting and begging who's blind. And now all of a sudden, he's standing up. He's not sitting. He's looking them straight in the eyes. He's not begging. And so he's completely out of context. That could be one reason why they're not sure. Is this the, is this the guy that we've always seen here? And I get the context thing, because to be honest, sometimes that happens to me. You know, here I am on Sundays and Wednesdays and Pastor G behind the pulpit, you know, trying to, trying to look decent, you know, and HD looks good on me. Do you know what I'm saying to you? <laughs> and then, and then during the week, I'm like at Home Depot with shorts and a t-shirt on and a baseball hat pushing a cart and people are like, Pastor G, is that you? And some say, yeah, that's really him. And others say, no, it only looks like him. And I'm like, no, it really is me. <laughs> But I'm, I'm out of context. People are like, wait, you actually go to Home Depot? You actually, you actually buy groceries too? Yeah, you know? I haul mulch and I haul milk, you know? And I do that kind of thing every once in a while. I get the context thing. Could be the context thing. But let me tell you what I think is really going on here. I think he was invisible to them. And I think he was invisible because he had been there for a long time. We don't know how old the guy is, but his parents say he is of age. Let him answer himself. A young man became responsible morally for his choices at the age of 13 when he was bar mitzvahed. But he's probably older than that. The age of a man when he was eligible for military service was 20 in the Bible. He's probably at least 20. And a man who turned 30 was considered actually an adult. And so he's probably been there a couple of decades. And they've been passing by him day after day, year after year after year, until he became invisible to them. And they tuned him out. He was all too familiar. And they just tuned him out so that one day he's standing looking at them eye to eye, and they don't even recognize him because for so long they've ignored him. Now, I think this speaks to us because I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of the neighbors for just a moment. And think to ourselves how many people we walk by day after day after day and we don't realize how much they need Jesus. They're just another familiar face. Oh, that's the same guy on the metro I see every day on my way into the office. That's the same lady teller at the bank. That's the same guy who clerks at the grocery store. And over and over again, we see the same familiar faces until we ignore them and forget that they need Jesus too. But there's another angle. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the blind man. And I want you to think for a moment about how others perceive you when you encounter Jesus. Sometimes people won't recognize you. 
And they won't recognize you when you have an encounter with Jesus because they will always see you in the context of your past. And they will judge you on the person they've always known you to be rather than on the person that you have become. They can't possibly comprehend that a personal encounter with Jesus could transform you into a completely different person. And so, for you note takers, a reminder, we will encounter the neighbors from time to time. Not everyone will see you as a new person. They will still judge you by your past. Well, that's on them. But you live your life as a new creature in Christ, and you don't worry about the neighbors. They will always be neighbors who will look at you, and they don't see you as a new creature in Christ. They will still judge you for the past. That's on them. You know that the Lord has done a new work in your life. Let the neighbors be neighbors. You be you, and don't let them concern you. The second group we see here in the story are the guy's parents. Now, can I just say this? The parents remind us that not everyone will be happy for you when you have a come to Jesus moment. His parents try to distance themselves from him. And why did they do that? They tried to distance themselves from their son when they're brought before the Pharisees because verse 22 tells us that since the religious leaders did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, anybody who did accept him as Messiah would be excommunicated and kicked out of the synagogue. And the parents knew that. So when they come in to give testimony about their son, this is so pathetic because instead of rejoicing over the miracle that their son had received, they're more concerned about their membership in church than their relationship with their son. They're more concerned about their reputation with their religious leaders than they are to celebrate the miracle that their son has experienced. Think about this. Their son has never seen their faces. And instead of rejoicing with him and being excited and celebrating and worshiping Jesus with him, they distance themselves. They stiff arm him. They say to the religious leaders, well, you know, technically he is our son. Yeah, and uh, technically he has been blind from birth. But how he got this miracle, we don't really know. He's of age. Ask him. And they completely deflect and the process they reject. Can you imagine being the son? You've just had this wonderful miracle for the first time you can see, and your parents are acting like they're complete strangers, like they have nothing to do with you. And this is what is happening here. And we need to be reminded, this same thing can happen today. It's true for us. When Jesus touches our lives, there will be some people, even within our own family, who will not rejoice with us, they will reject us. They will not want to have anything to do with us. You have a come to Jesus moment, some people, sure, they'll celebrate with you. But there'll be some friends and family all of a sudden who will distance themselves from you. They want nothing to do with you. And we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34 to 36, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. He said, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Now, those are strong words, and Jesus wasn't saying that intentionally he sows division within families, but he's saying practically when someone comes to faith in Jesus, it's going to create within every family either rejoicing or rejecting, because you will either be liked and celebrated with, or you're going to have family that's just like, I want nothing to do with you now. You got this Jesus thing happening, so it shouldn't surprise us. There are parents, and I mean that in a generic term all around us, friends and family who want nothing to do with us. Again, don't worry about the neighbors, don't worry about the parents. In this story, this guy realized Jesus had done something for him, and he wasn't going to let the neighbors or the parents deter that. And then the third group are the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They represent to us the reminder that not everyone will believe that Jesus saves. Aside from the fact that these religious leaders had already rejected Jesus as the Messiah, they didn't appreciate the fact that this miracle happened on Shabbat, the Sabbath. They're like, you know what, you're not supposed to even do any work. And they categorized a miracle as work on the Sabbath. 
which tells us something about the Pharisees, doesn't it? That they were all about the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. Because Jesus said that man was made for the Sabbath, or rather the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the, the, the benefit of man that happens on the Sabbath is actually a fulfillment of the Sabbath, not a violation of it. So any good that can happen towards man on the Sabbath, any benefit for man is a fulfillment of the Sabbath law, not a violation of it. But these religious leaders were so myopic, they're so focused on, wait a minute, we think this constitutes work, this falls under the category of work, this is the Sabbath, you shouldn't be working, we don't care this guy received a sight, we're not going to rejoice or celebrate with him. In fact, we don't even believe that Jesus saves. They had outright rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and they were about now to reject this guy because he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. This guy says, I'm a disciple of Jesus. They're like, well, fine, but we're a disciple of Moses, and we don't even know this Jesus guy and where he comes from. You see, they had rejected Jesus outright, thus they rejected any miracle this guy had. In fact, when you read the verses carefully, what they end up saying to the guy is, we don't even think you were born blind. We don't even think this is a legitimate miracle. We're not buying this. And by the way, don't school us. We're going to school you. You're a sinner, and so is this Jesus character. And they excommunicate him. And not everybody will believe when you tell them that Jesus has saved you, that Jesus can save you. They will reject Jesus altogether. They're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus in you. And so... When Jesus hears that this guy had been excommunicated from the synagogue, let's read the rest of the chapter, verse 35. Jesus goes looking for him. It's very tender here, the way this ends. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. And then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. In other words, you claim to know me, you claim to know God, and so because you claim that you can see, the reality is that you're blind because you don't know me because you have rejected me, you don't accept me. But to everyone who acknowledges, I want to see, then Jesus opens the eyes of the blind to be able to see who he really is. So this is much more than physical sight. This guy got a double miracle that day. He got physical sight and he got spiritual sight because the eyes of his heart were opened to who Jesus really is. And this is something all of us need because most of us, there might be someone here who doesn't have physical sight, but almost all of us, if not all of us, need spiritual sight. You could be seeing physically but blind spiritually. And God wants to do a miracle in your life too by opening the eyes of your heart. This is why Jesus said there in John 9, 39, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. And let me tell you something, when you make a decision and you pray and you ask, Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I can see you and know you in a personal way, just like the neighbors, not everyone will see you as a new person. They will still judge you by your past. Just like the parents, not everyone will be happy for you. In fact, some will reject you. And just like the Pharisees, not everyone will believe that you could actually be saved. But none of that matters. What matters is that Jesus might open the eyes of our heart that we might see him as the one who loves us, who died for us, to forgive us of our sins and to open wide heaven for all who believe and receive him. This is my prayer for you. If you don't know him in a personal way, open the eyes of your heart today and see him. You can receive the same miracle this guy received here at the end of this chapter by knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray and then we're going to receive communion. Lord, I thank you for this story because it's a reminder to us that we can be physically seeing but spiritually blind. 
And I thank you, Lord, for the reminder that this guy was rebuffed by many people. His neighbors didn't recognize him. His parents rejected him. The religious leaders excommunicated him, but you received him. You accepted him. And the eyes of his heart were also open to see you and know you as Lord and Savior. And I pray, God, that there are people here today and those watching online and people who will listen to this study later who would be willing to say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you too. I want to know you in a personal way. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I go to heaven when I die. And so, Lord, open the eyes of my heart today. And I, I'm just going to pause in my prayer, still with your heads bowed. Look, you can pray that simple prayer right now with me. Just, just pray this right where you're seated. You can say, Lord, I want to see you. I want to know you. Open the eyes of my heart that I might trust you today as my Lord and Savior. And I don't care what the neighbors say, the parents say, or anybody says, I believe you today. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender to you. I want to receive the same miracle today. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I might see you and know you in a personal way. Thank you, Jesus. And now, Lord, as we come to your table to remember your sacrifice on the cross, we are grateful and thankful that you shed your blood for our sins, that you died on a cross, so that by faith in what you did, we can have our sins forgiven, we can go to heaven when we die. We just rejoice today that you are Lord and Savior, and you paid the great price, you sacrificed your life on a cross so that we might have life through faith in your name. As we receive the elements now, Lord, we are grateful and thankful people. In Jesus' name.